Hi, welcome back to the second part of the lectures on experimental design. Uh, if you stayed awake through the first part, you were uh, hopefully introduced to the basic ideas of what constitutes an experiment. Having blathered on about that forever, I want to try to move on now to basic experimental designs where I want to try to lay out for you now um, fundamental analysis of variance kinds of designs. I mention analysis of variance now because we're going to return to those analyses later in the semester. The reason why I'm talking about these now is that um, I want to try to reinforce the idea that the analysis that you do at the back end of a study after it's all finished is supposed to be completely consistent with the design of the experiment. So if we talk about a design, we are already prescribing what the analysis should be. So they should go hand in hand, and that's why you're going to see terms now, which you'll see again later on when we get around to analyses of variance. Some of which you, I hope you're already familiar with, but we'll get into the nitty gritties of them later on. Okay, so in all of these experimental designs that we're talking about today, um, we'll be talking about categorical treatments, which means that rather than a whole smear of lots of different kinds of conditions, think about it like a regression, where you have lots of possible values up and down your x-axis. In this case, instead, we have only certain values on the x-axis, categories. So low, medium, high, something like that is what I'll be talking about today. And there are experimental designs where you can compare pre and post treatment. We'll talk about those first. Then secondly, there are some that you just evaluate one factor at a time, and then secondly, two factors at a time. And then we can get fancier. We can break those down uh, into subsets. So we'll get around to randomized blocks, Latin square designs, and split plots. And then finally, I'll explain briefly what we mean by covariates. As you might guess by the name, it's something that varies also, so co-varies with your treatments. And you can account for that statistically. And then we're just going to mention the idea of repeated measures designs, those being experiments in which you keep sampling over and over again the same unit. So you weigh me, and then I go on a diet, and you weigh me again, and you weigh me again, etc. Okay? Not that we want to necessarily do that study. I think that could be kind of embarrassing for me. Okay. So let's talk about some basic experimental design ideas. If we want to talk about pre- and post-treatment first, that would be um, a classic idea would be if you had a bunch of individuals in a clinical trial and you, um, oh, we'll stick with weights for a minute. Uh, you it weigh them first, you, they go through some sort of diet regimen, exercise regimen, something like that, and you could weigh them again after. Um, you would have a pre-treatment condition and a post-treatment condition. Think about it as a blood cholesterol levels or something pre and post medication. The idea being simply that the average and the variance of the pre-treatment might look different than the average and the variance of the post-treatment. This bell curve represents the distribution. Think of it as a histogram with a bunch of vertical bars and you've smoothed it out by drawing a line over the top of those bars. That center point would be the area that is most common, the, the bars being the heights uh, representing um, the number of individuals at a certain value on our sliding scale here. So A would be the first mean, and there's a variation around that first mean, and K, the same thing, a mean plus its variation. The idea, back to the graph again, is just to be able to see if you think the average of A is different from the average of K. Another way to say that is whether or not there's too much overlap there in that zone where A and K meet. All right? If there's a lot of overlap, then you'd have a hard time saying these two means are different. Little overlap, the opposite. And that's, of course, what somebody might hope for if they're administering treatments to people like that. Okay, so we could also represent those bell curves uh, in a box plot. I hope you've seen these before. This is like a sideways representation of your bell curve, where this is that center point, and in this case, with a box plot, these are represented by the median, not the mean, the median. If I go backwards, this was a mean, an average, whereas the box plot is our median, but essentially the same idea. This would be way out on the low end, or I'm sorry, on the high end of the bell curve, and then the low end here. So the bell curve is turned sideways. It peaks in the middle and then tails off, right? like that. Same idea here. 
Now by comparing the box plots left and right, you can already see that it looks like the median of the one on the right is a little bit below the median on the left and outside that box. The box represents 25th percent quartile. So this is the median is 50 percent. This makes 75 percent of the data below this value. This makes 25 percent of the uh, data below this value. So 50 in the middle, 75, 25 percentiles, and then the whiskers, typically in most software, represent 10 percent. Now you might get outliers which should show points beyond those whiskers. So 90 percent of the variables falling uh, within those whiskers, 50 percent of the variables between 75 and 25 falling within inside the box. And there are, are statistical tests to see if that distribution on the right is different from that on the left. Okay, a mean or a median or any of these distributions like in a box plot represents multiple subjects. You have replicates. You've applied a treatment to multiple individuals. You get the pre-treatment data on each individual like here before and then you treat them, for example, with a cholesterol treatment and then you collect the post-treatment data on each of those individuals again. You simply compare the pre and post-treatment responses. This is called a paired t-test. We'll be doing it again later in the semester. It's paired because you're matching the pre and the post data per individual. So there's a pair of data for each individual. And the idea then is to um, represent the variation between individuals in that response at while you're doing this paired t-test. That would be different than if I just took a random number of befores and a random number of afters and didn't match them up for individuals. You see? That's what a paired t-test does. Matches them for the individuals. Okay, so that'd be a classic way to look at pre- and post-treatment kinds of analyses. Another way to do this would be to apply one kind of treatment. Um, for example, I'm going to talk about fertilizer just because I'm going to try to maintain this agricultural theme that we started with here. So if I were to apply fertilizer in three levels, no fertilizer, and I'm calling that my negative control, right? I did nothing to it. Uh, the low and the high. So no low and high, and let's say for example I have five replicates. That would be one factor, fertilizer, with three levels including my controls. Okay? If you want to say two levels plus control, okay fine. So this is a fairly straightforward, most simple experimental design. Notice that we're going one step beyond the pre and post where now I can have three levels. I can have as many as I want. Of course the the bigger the number of levels, the bigger the experiment, the more complicated it can be. Okay, so let's think about if you're talking about one factor. Data might look like this. I applied no fertilizer and my plants grew more or less, eh, let's call it four centimeters, give or take, right? They grow a little bit bigger with low fertilizer, they grow even higher with high fertilizer. You define those levels of the factor first. You have a control, zero, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, whatever your levels might be, all the way up to some ups upper number and then you would randomly assign units to each of those treatment levels. That's a key. I didn't know in advance that pot number 172 was going to be assigned to a certain treatment. They're assigned at random, so there's just as much chance that a high-growing individual might occur in the no fertilizer treatment as in any of the other treatments. That means that this individual is just as likely to be down here and you can by the power of logic and inference, then assume that the effects that you see comparing the high ones to the no and the low are due only to the treatment, right? If you were not random, this is a big deal because we forget this all the time, if you're not random, then you'd have to worry that some of these might have been already higher growing plants, okay? All right, so it's pretty straightforward. You would treat these, fertilize them, let them grow for some predetermined time, and then uh, record the responses and you conduct this one-way analysis of variance which again we'll be getting to later in the semester okay all right so we've already whipped through the pre and post treatment ideas a one-factor type of analysis of variance design uh, where it's just increasing levels of one factor we're going to spend more time talking about two factors because it's more complicated but it's also adding a whole lot more sophistication to your analyses and what I really mean is your ability to infer what's going on in an experiment. So if we're talking about two plus factors, I'm saying two plus because you could add a third one here, a fourth one, etc. It just gets a lot more complicated. So I'm going to illustrate these with two. You could have a, a multi-factor study where you define the factors and the levels of each factor first. The same way we do with a single one. So 
if I have treatment A and B, I just have two levels of B, B1 and B2, right? But if I have treatment A, I have one, two, three, four, five levels of A, an increasing series of, let's say, concentration uh, represented by the uh, gray to black scales, and then B1, B2, just by simply two different colors, okay? So what I've defined then are these all possible combinations of A and B levels. A1, B1, A1, B2, etc. Okay? That means I have a factorial combination. It's five levels of A times two levels of B, right? I randomly assign units to each treatment combination, just like before. My pots are randomly assigned to different fertilizers, etc. Before, now it's the same idea. That randomness, again, meaning that differences I observe later must be due to the treatments, not due to some other pre existing condition in my plant or whatever my experimental unit is. I can treat and record those responses, and then I conduct a two-way analysis of variance. Okay? Sound familiar? We just have one-way versus two-way. So, a factorial design allows you to look at in interactions between treatments, whereas before with only one treatment, I don't know what else might be modifying those effects. But with a two-factor fa design, I can say how much does A depend on B? Or you could flip that. How much does the effect of B depend on A? So, to talk about the experiment I'm setting up over here, does treatment A alter the effect of B? Do I get a different series of responses in the left-hand column than I do in the right-hand column? That would mean that B is affecting the response of A. Does treatment A alter the effect of B? You could flip that the other way. The greater the concentration of I, A I have, I might have a different response than I have over here in B. So you can see you can word this either way. I think you have to decide which one makes most sense for your study. These effects might enhance, they might multiply, or they might counteract or, or uh, decrease the opposite treatment. Um, what we're essentially looking for here is that if it's a multiplicative kind of response. If, if A was, um, I'm going to make this up, nitrogen, and B was phosphorus. I might think of these as simply additive treatments. If I put some nitrogen in, that's good. There's already phosphorus in the pot of soil. But if I put some more phosphorus in, then I get a better growth in my plant. The question really here is whether it's more than an additive effect if I compare the responses across. So we want to know if it's increasing more than additively when I put in nitrogen and phosphorus in different concentrations. Or is there no interaction at all? Okay. This simple distinction here between a one-way and a two-way analysis of variance kind of design, a two-factor factorial d experiment versus a one-factor, means that we can look at far more complicated interactions out there in nature. You can examine if a factor's effects depend on the presence or absence or level of another factor. This is important because we know nature is fairly complicated and we want to try to get beyond real simplistic one-factor type understandings of nature. So imagine an experiment like I've set up over here. A has five levels, B has two. A factorial design gives me all those levels of A for each of the two levels of B. Okay. Now what I want to do is try to see if I can tease apart when is A most important, when is B most important, and is there an interaction. So an e easy way to visualize this, and uh, an important way, because often people present them this way graphically as results, are interaction plots. So if we have this experiment that I just described, A and B, with the two different colors representing each other, there's multiple possible outcomes. I could get no main effect where there's essentially no significant effects, no interactions. The two lines are almost parallel and flat, which means no matter what I do across my levels of A, for instance, I don't really get a response. And if I look at the effect of the different level of B, it's basically the same thing. So there's no effect of A, and there's really such a similarity between the two lines that you can't say there's any sort of effect of B either. Okay, That would be no significant effects and no interactions. The boring effect, there's nothing happening. Okay, but let's think about it this way. If factor A is significant, as I increase my levels of A1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc., I might see higher and higher growth levels of my plants, right? But notice that again, the B line, the red and blue lines, I should say, are virtually parallel. There's no real big difference between those two lines. So there's no effect of B. B didn't change the increasing levels of response due to A. Right? So there's no interaction, although there is an effect of A.
So we have one factor that's significant. I might also see that there's basically no effect of A, which means that as I increase levels across A, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, there's a flat response. But the two different colored lines, the two different factors of B are different. If I add in more something, B, then I get a higher growth. Notice that A is basically flat. There's no response to A. But when I have more B, boom, I get a different response. So I see effective A in the graph above. I see an effective B in the graph below. That's pretty nice because I can tease apart which factor is most important. And then you can also might ex uh, be able to expect that here I have an effect of A and there's a difference between the red and blue lines I have an effect of B. But notice that there's no interaction here. It's a constant effect of A for both of those lines and it's a fairly constant effect of B as I jump up from level 1 to 2 because those lines are parallel. So this says that there's no interaction between those two factors. Factors A and B are significant. Here only B is significant. Here only A is significant. But there's no interaction. What's most interesting is when we want to look at the combination of the effects that give you contrasting responses. So the effect of A is opposite for the different levels of B. Here A decreases the response as I increase on the x-axis. But in the presence of the other level of B, it increases. So I get an opposite effect depending on what level of B is going on. That simple inference, that simple graph that you might be able to present in results is something that would be really nice to be able to show if you find something that's fairly complicated out there in nature. The ones we talked about are fairly straightforward. Only A or only B or neither is going on. What we are most interested in is when you can explain something that's more complex in nature. And this is um, something that people use regularly to demonstrate an interaction effect. All right? So it means that you get different levels of response to A if you have different levels of B. There's an interaction. They multiply against each other. Okay. That's an important outcome. People see these kinds of things when they look at gene by environment interactions, for example. Okay. One last possibility is that it isn't a complete crossing over. You can see that the lines might cross. The effect of A depends on the level of B. A goes up for one level more than it does for the other level. This is still a significant interaction effect. Let me go back. The other one is also significant, but it's clearly crossing over. This one would cross over if only you'd gone a little bit lower in your levels of A, let's say. All right. So this would also represent a significant interaction but not necessarily the obvious, completely encompassing treatment levels that you have in the top one. Okay, So there's a significant effect there, and it depends on B. OK, so are there any examples of this out there? This might help illustrate how this is useful. Well, there's one I found in the literature. This is a nice study. They were looking at the effects of eutrophication, more fertilizer, um, in big buckets, uh, cattle tanks, which are wonderful experimental units for studying ecology because they're self-contained, they're replicable, you can arrange them any way you want, you can have matching treatments, um, and they're exposed to nature so they're somewhat subject to the natural variations. You can put a lot of stuff in them so they can be complex little systems, ecosystems actually. And what you have there is then this experiment where they want to know if more nutrients interacts with pathogen infection and amphibians. And as you can see from the frog with the weird leg here, there's this pathogen, trematode, which infects amphibians and causes growth early in development as a larva of extra limbs or deformed limbs. So they've been noticing higher and higher levels of these deformities in frogs across the US and uh, other parts of the world too, and wondering what causes this. There's been a lot of hypotheses, a lot of experiments. Um, lots of ideas on what might be doing it. And finally, people have narrowed down to this trematode. But then, of course, the question is, what causes more trematode prevalence? So the hypothesis in this experiment was that more nutrients makes more algae, which is snail food. So you can see here growing in this tank picture where there's lots of filamentous algae. There's going to have a lot more food for snails. There's going to be lots more snails. Those are the intermediate host for this parasite. And if you have more of those intermediate hosts, there should be more parasite prevalence, and therefore frogs will be more likely infected with the parasites. Okay, So the, through several steps, 
the idea is that more nutrients ultimately cause more deformities in frogs. So eutrophication, kind of like back to that experiment I talked about with the lakes uh, and the rubber curtain separating the two lakes. Nutrient runoff is essentially one of our fundamental problems in uh, lots of aquatic ecology. So this simple experiment used two levels of nutrient and three levels of parasite. Okay, So you can already tell we have a two-factor experiment. Low and high nutrients and no low high levels of parasites. Okay, They arrayed the tanks in a field, randomized across this zone. They put screens on top to keep things from getting in and eating their tadpoles and messing around with their experiment. Here the picture shows all the screens are taken off just so you'll see what's inside the tanks. Okay, so what did they find? More nutrients cause more snails with infections. They, in other words, the snails were infected with a parasite and there was a higher load of those parasites per snail. So the infected snails per meter squared with the high nutrient condition cranking up the fastest and then the low, no and low uh, didn't really, um, wait a minute, I'm getting this wrong. Hang on, here's the key. The no parasite input, low and high. Those are my treatments. So here's my high parasite input and when in the high nutrient condition with high parasites I get an interaction which means that those that specific treatment combination generated the highest parasite load um, in the snails and also generated the most infected snails. Okay, So in the low nutrient condition you can tell by contrast there's not as much of an effect. Okay, So that's the nutrient effect and if I look at the infection load, so carrier per infected snail per 24 hours, the low nutrients, it's an effect of snail size as well, they tend to be lower levels of infection and here there's higher nutrient levels, they tend to be higher levels of infection, but there's also an effect of snail size because if there's more food, snails grow bigger. Okay, So bigger snails will have more cercaria and they grow faster in higher nutrient levels, on the meaning that you have bigger snails. Okay, so then the amphibian infection, infection ultimately, here's n there's no um, parasite levels added and uh, they got no parasites, thankfully. But then when you see low and high nutrients at low parasites versus high parasite levels, it takes off rapidly, um, multiplicatively, ex extensively. So there's the bottom line is that if you put more nutrients into the tanks, um, you also get bigger snails, which then means there's more um, host tissue for those parasites to be feeding on the snails. That contributes to a greater load of cercaria, the infective stages of the parasites in the tanks. The frog in infections accelerate uh, in the parasite load, but what they figured out statistically is that this is not a significant interaction. It's just simply a function of nutrient levels. So they were able to tease apart the effects of interaction and find that there was none. There was not an interaction between these. Okay. Here's another example. I mentioned before gene by environment interactions. They um, would look at um, these different kinds of uh, gene by environment interactions by looking at the seeding density of cells uh, in a perfusion uh, culture system and looking at the flow rate, the flow rate of cells in this culture system. And they looked at the expression of different genes and they simply described the zone in which they find expression. Um, and it here would be the expression of all possible genes combined. So this is saying that there's a lot of points inside that zone and they just kind of depict it as a polygon uh, encompassing all of their points. Okay, So what they wanted to see is if there's no significant effects, if there's this um, different kinds of uh, interaction effects, of course. And what they're saying here is that there is an interaction because there is this uh, intersection of these possible expressions and um, they find that that gene by environment uh, interaction is occurring across all the genes because these aren't simply linear responses, right? They're seeing some sort of crossing overs, right? So let's see. We've talked about briefly a factorial design. Now we're going to get a little fancier because you can take this factorial design and you can arrange those factorial treatments in multiple ways in space, which is important because if you have um, treatments on one side of the greenhouse or on uh, the other side of the greenhouse, you might get very different conditions. So an important way to represent spatially different conditions is something called randomized blocks. So what I have right here is blocks one, two, three, four, and notice that 
all the treatments, all my combinations of A1, B2, for instance, are in every block. Here's A1, B2 down here. Randomly, it's tossed up here. And randomly, it shows up over here again. And here it is again. Every combination of A and B appears in every block. All right? So you could say block 1 represents one full set of every one of my treatments. But it's not replicated, right? To be replicated, I need to have a second block, a third block, etc. All right, so a randomized block is a spatial unit that includes all the treatments and represents one replicate of each of those treatments. Now, why would we want to do something like this? Well, I'm going back to my greenhouse. I, I visualize this every time I think about these things. Imagine I've got the sun pumping in through my greenhouse. And I hope you recognize that sun. I looked hard for that. Find a good graphic of him. Her, actually, it's a her. And the uh, sun is pouring in through the glass. And the inside of the greenhouse, it receives less sunlight, more, more temperature, more sun, etc., on the outside than on the inside. So if I have a gradient across my treatments, I want to impose blocks, one, two, three, four, that represent that gradient downhill or downstream or whatever my gradient might be, in this case from bright sunshine to shaded. Okay, That gradient is going to be really important because it applies to pretty much anything you can imagine that might be unidirectional. And we have lots of those settings. Um, I've used this for shade effects, for example. Um, you might imagine slopes on hillsides, uh, nutrient types. Now, this doesn't have to necessarily be a linear gradient in space. Block 1 might be imposed on one side of the field. Block 2 might be imposed in a different chunk of the field where you know that you have different soil types, different nutrient levels. You can map them out. And they may not be necessarily in a row in space, but I can say that represents this chunk, that represents that chunk, and I've accounted for that spatial variation then. Okay, so. When I say a gradient, the gradient doesn't have to be a linear slope, for instance. It can be something that's more patchy. The idea being that a block represents that patch. Okay. Well, here's another way to think about this. Latin squares. It is another way, and it comes back to an agricultural arrangement, where every row has, uh, let's start with columns, it's easy to see. Every column, A, B, C, D, E, F, right there, has all the treatments. And every row has all the treatments, A, B, C, D, E, F, right? So every row and every column has every treatment. If you've played with Sudoku, you know what I'm talking about, OK? So this is an, a grid. It's very much a square grid because you have this kind of constraint, this layout, OK? But it's also very nice to be able to say if I have a two-way kind of gradient. Let's say, imagine uh, my, my one-way slope, uh, my gradient that I talked before with um, the randomized blocks. Every column would represent one replicate of my treatments, right? And if I had another slope going this way, so now the whole table tilts down from the upper left to lower right. In other words, I've got this two-way angle here. Then I would say every row also represents every replicate. It's a relatively rare phenomenon, I think, in nature to say that you've got this nice, even symmetrical gradient that goes two different directions. But it's been applied fairly regularly when you have a lot of control over your environment like you do in agriculture. So it's a fairly common design. So this is what I'm trying to say. One gradient versus a second gradient. And you can arrange your plots to adjust for and account for the effects of those gradients. Okay. So if we're accounting for another uh, treatment, a gradient in, let's say, uh, how wet the soil is, or um, how much fertilizer is already in the soil, um, how sandy the soil might be, something like that, we're already trying to account for some other sort of effects in our design. Well, another way to do that would be if you are talking about randomization that is not uniform across your whole experiment. You have to conduct randomizations in two different chunks, let's say. Some part of the experiment can be repeated in another part. Okay, Let me see if I can illustrate this. A split plot design is where you have a factor that differs between plots. It's, it's place specific. So if I go back to my Latin square, this was one field where I could get both of my gradients accounted for in one big square. What if I didn't have that much space? What if I wanted to be able to look at my treatments in two different plots? 
here's one field let's say and here's a second field my main plots now let's look inside this in the first plot the first main plot a column has a2 b3 etc and a1 etc and the others and the others so I've got two replicates in here right here's a2 b2 in the bottom left and on the upper right I have two replicates in the main plot and I have a repeat of that again here's a1 b2 for example and here's a1 b2 again so I have replicates inside each main plot and if I look at the difference between the main plots what do I have the same basic idea this set of treatments up here is a replicate of the second set of treatments down here so we have an experiment that's conducted identically in the two regions the main plots where the treatments in one region match that of the other region everything that's done in the main plot number one is repeated again in the second main plot number two why would I do this well maybe we're doing experiments that are fairly far apart maybe um, this is in different regions or this is entirely different fields and I can't necessarily set up this simple gradient across the field um, this is useful pl for places that are spatially separated and you don't have complete control over everything that's going on everything that's happening in this first main plot might be a different history different landscape conditions etc than you have in the second main plot so I conduct an experiment in the, each plot in each place but everything about that matches in the two different plots so then I can compare the effect of plots in the end okay so are there any examples of this out there yeah people do this in crops all the time for example um, I've done this uh, with some of my research my masters was based on a split plot so these kinds of things are fairly common it would be where you have again two fields and you get growing different kinds of crops transgenic crops or isoline crops and you, you replicate those treatments notice that we've got different kinds of layouts different arrangements different randomizations here's another one and I call this a split plot example even though these people didn't analyze it as this they had eight different European field sites where they treated uh, different um, levels of plant diversity to see what happened with primary productivity eight different places they could have analyzed this as a big split plot analysis the problem was that they weren't looking at the same kind of response in every place they saw and sometimes curvilinear responses in other cases fancier shapes but this is essentially a split plot analysis where each of these countries represented a plot where they conducted the same experiment in their case it was sort of similar pretty close kinds of experiments notice that the number of plants that they have here starting with 32 and down to 1 wasn't the same everywhere and that's why it's not quite a split plot here they did have 32 all the way down to 1 here the most they had was I think 15 or something like that so eh, you can't quite call a split plot but I was just messing with this data just recently and I thought maybe that was a decent example very different places with very different biogeographic histories where they do a very similar experiment ideally in a split plot it would be identical okay to be truly a split plot which is why these guys weren't actually doing a split plot but they tried it was close okay so how about covariates then you're already getting the idea of a covariate it is something in addition to your experiment outside of your controls that you managed for your experiment that you want to account for a covariate is some unplanned factor then that varies across the experiment you couldn't assign it to blocks I couldn't put say that it was this patch in my experiment I couldn't necessarily put it in um, split plots but I can measure it um, let's go back to our fields of crops imagine pH pH isn't something I can manage very well without really amending the soils a lot with lots of extra chemicals I don't want to mess things up but I can measure pH and I can then account for it in the experimental analyses later so that's a covariate it makes a difference I want to account for it but I didn't necessarily treat it okay to covary then means that it's varying with our our experiment it is something that might be tilting the playing field of the experiment I want to try to level that playing field when I include it in my analyses so you know what that means it means you already thought in advance about getting the data for it it's not something you just go back and say later oh I wonder if it was pH maybe we should go back and measure it no you have to have measured it during the experiment you have to have those data to include them in your analyses later that means you're thinking in advance about possible covariates before you do an experiment that's an important detail there
Okay, so an analysis of covariance, we'll get back to these, you're going to do some later in the semester, is essentially doing this analysis of variance like we've been talking about, looking at interaction effects, etc. And there's a regression built into it at the same time. So the regression is a way to account for how much tilt is there, for example, with your pH or something. And then after accounting for that tilt, conducting the analysis of variance on that level playing field. Okay? The assumption is that your field is tilted nice and smooth across all your treatments. It's one nice slope that you can put a regression to and then express mathematically by that regression. All treatment groups then have that same response to pH. and It's uniformly affecting everything. That's a, an assumption you have to worry about a little bit, but we'll, we'll get back to that when we actually get to the analyses. Okay, what about repeated measures analyses? I mentioned this before. You take samples again and again of the same individuals. Well, this is done a lot also in, in um, biological research. We keep sampling the same individual to see what's going on with it. Um, it's led to a lot of confusion because people haven't always analyzed this correctly, partly because it was very um, awkward to do this in the classic ANOVA methods, the old style um, kinds of analyses that we're going to start with this semester make repeated measures pretty difficult to do. Um, essentially you're treating time like it's a covariate. This thing that just happened in your experiment, it's not really planned. You didn't say these are the effects of days one, three, five, etc. They essentially think of time as a random factor is what happens. So it's awkward in these former uh, kinds of analyses that we'll play with mostly this semester. Um, Time is complicated to analyze because you might expect if something's growing, um, the data you obtained yesterday will affect today's data. You don't get a random effect each day because something that's already bigger will be even bigger again the next time. So there's an autocorrelation, they call it, a temporal autocorrelation in your responses. So it's not as if it's an independent sample each time you take time samples, right? Um, there's changes in between and there's all kinds of things that are just kind of lumped into effects of time. Anything that happened through time, storms, um, raccoons getting into your experiment, lots of things you might chalk up to time effects. Okay, So that means it's best handled as a random factor. But that's if you're not really interested in wanting to know what happens the effect of day one, three, and five. You don't. It, that's not the essential part of your experiment if you're treating as a random factor. You're treating as a random factor if you just want to address the effect of time in your study and you don't necessarily pick certain days on purpose because that's the point. Okay? If you just want to address the effects of time, then it's simple to treat it as a random factor. And that's what the former types of analyses would try to do as well. They did it clumsily. Um, and that would make it a repeated measures analysis. It's like saying I grew these things in the fields over time and besides the effect of time, things just growing in sunshine, etc., I want to know did my treatments matter. Okay? So we're already tiptoeing towards the difference between fixed and random effects. This turns out to be difficult. It's not that obvious. Um, trust me on this. There's a number of us who've been trying to sort this out over multiple years on an experiment we've been conducting. So if you think about it real simply, um, you might say that your fixed effects, for example, a fertilizer that you apply, are constant across observations. The fertilizer is in the ground, it stays in the ground, that's what I think. Whereas a random effect might vary across observations. It's ephemeral, it comes and goes. Um, the amount of water in the soil depends on how much it rained. That rain might be a random factor in that case, okay? Whereas if I put a certain amount of fertilizer in, it tends to stay in the soil, speaking simplistically. Okay, if I specifically chose treatment levels, um, I want to know about my no, low, and high levels of fertilizer. That would be a fixed effect. Random factors would be treatments that are Sam subsamples of all possible options. Um, you l could literally think of it as pulling numbers out of a hat and those happen to be your treatments that you observe if it's a random effect. Okay. Whereas fixed effect you say no I chose those levels of phosphorate, phosphorus and nitrogen to put in the soils. They weren't just random. I meant to pick those numbers. That's another way people think about fixed effects. Okay. Here's another one distinction between fixed and random. The main point is really to compare the effects of those different levels, uh, low, no, low, high, right? Whereas random effects, it's kind of like that 
temporal effect. I don't really want to know exactly what happened on day three versus day five. I just want to account for the effect of time. Some people say that's a way to describe a random effect, whereas I'm clearly intending on a fixed effect to know about the difference between those two levels. Another way people describe it is that the observations are independent for a fixed effect, where I have a plot, I put fertilizer in that plot, and separately on the other side of the field I did another treatment. Those are independent. I made those observations independently then. I go out and I count the plants, I measure them separately from the measurements in the other site. Okay. Whereas in a random effect they might be interdependent. That means that my counts or measurements in one place might be related to the ones in the other place. That's a little harder to visualize if we're talking about plants, but what if you're sampling something that is mobile, like animals, that you sample over here and then you walk across your field and you sample here in this place where I'm standing right now and I might be seeing the same dragonflies. Maybe the same dragonflies are over here and I'm counting them, or birds. Those might be Mo less obviously independent observations. Okay, So here's multiple definitions then of fixed and random effects and how people try to think through fixed versus random treatments that they're applying in their experiments. These are not always applied fully. That full list doesn't necessarily work in all situations. But what we're seeing then are different ways that people have tried to identify fixed versus random effects in the literature. This is messy. Some people have said we shouldn't even worry about these two distinctions. Um, on the other hand, that's what a lot of our analyses do. Our analyses are set up to be for fixed versus random effects. So we're going to stick with this kind of terminology in this course and in methods two. Okay? Let me see if I can give you an example. Here is an experiment on the left that I conducted once before where it was just like those cattle tanks I showed you before. We had these big things out here and we had these different treatments I won't bore you with. P0 and P plus and T0 and T plus. We had different levels of these conditions. And there was a big tree line right here and the west wind tended to blow leaves across the field. So fortunately when we we're setting up this experiment we thought of this and said what we need to do is have blocks that are just like what I described before, a gradient, one, two, three, four, where we expected more leaves to pile up over here in the buckets in column one and less leaves to pile up in the column four. Okay, That's a fixed effect. We made blocks on purpose to try to account for the effects of leaves falling in that we could not stop. Okay, Because we wanted, in this case, to not have screens on top of our big buckets. That's different from treating a bunch of different points scattered across a field as random. In this case, we treated the blocks in this big experiment across this big field, and those are wetlands, each of these little colored sites being the ones that we sampled, that we treated these blocks as random, where we did make sort of a pie wedge shaped set in here to call it block, but we didn't really particularly try to account for any particular thing other than our sampling over here today and our sampling over there tomorrow. So if we treated this array as a random blocks, but we treated this as fixed blocks, what's the difference? The fixed was in advance trying to account for a particular gradient that we anticipated. The random one was trying to account for some sort of spatial variation that might happen somewhere in the experiment. Okay, So if I go back to this fixed versus random effects, let me see if I can come up with another example. Um, imagine I'm going back to my fertilization experiment. Nutrient doses. I might be mixing them up according to certain recipes and I'm spraying them onto plots. You know, the recipes are what the manufacturers recommend or something. Whereas a random effect might be I didn't actually apply any nutrients. All I really did was sample the soils in my plots out there in the field, measure how much f nutrient is already in those soils, it's kind of a random effect. Whatever happens to be there is there, and now I use that as my measure of nutrient effects. Okay, So in one case I applied according to a dose I wished for, and in another case I just used whatever happened to be available. Okay, Or maybe this one. Um, I measured the levels um, and they're fairly tight around low and high means. I did really well with my data. I, I 
put out a certain amount of fertilizer, I got that same amount of fertilizer. It's a really tight average, okay? Really similar variance. It's homoscedastic. We'll get back to that kind of terminology later in the semester, where the variances are very similar across each of my replicates and treatments, and they're normally distributed. Damn, I nailed that really well. Whereas these might be really messy. The random effects, some are really high, some are really low. The distribution's really skewed. Um, the variation around them is not normal. It's going to be ugly, okay? This would be something that makes sense because I uh, apply those treatments, I expect it. This might be something that happens if I just happen to sample in the soils and I don't necessarily get the prescribed levels, okay? So th these two so far are fairly consistent. Okay. If I applied fertilizer to certain soils, those treatments are independent. I mixed up a jug, I sprayed it over here, I mixed up a different jug, that's an independent treatment, and sprayed it over there. Okay, Those are independent treatments. That's really clear if we choose them and we can make it that way. The treatments in the soils in a random effect that are already in the soil are not necessarily independent. There might be nutrient movement through the soils, it depends somewhat on the soil types which are not necessarily completely independent across the field. There's gradients in soil types. There's all kinds of stair-stepping of different s labels of s soils. You know, are these all clay soils or are there some of them a loamy soil or are they uh, loamy clay? You know, it goes on and on. And so we end up with a lot of smearing between these treatments in the different plots across a the field. They're not quite as clear-cut distinctions as we might hope for. Okay. One last one. The observations that we collect are independent. I took a soil sample over here. I measured how much nutrient there is. The observations here might be interdependent, where, again, the amount of nutrient in one place might be somewhat depending on the level of nutrients in the other place because there's a net movement downhill, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe, again, think about mobile animals in that case. OK, so we treat these fixed and random effects as if there's a really hardcore distinction between them, okay? We think about, did you make fixed treatments, fixed effects, or do, are these uh, going to be random effects? You might think about the ANOVA design. You're making a treatment, those would be fixed effects. But there are times when you have to say, well, but wait a minute, are these actually random? So for example, the experiment I talked about in the big field, random blocks versus fixed blocks, was a, something we had to think through very carefully, okay? It turns out that the distinction between these things is not that obvious, and in fact, the analyses of how to go about this are, again, somewhat convoluted in the old methods, okay? So, what I want to try to explain to you here is, in this course, in Methods 1, we're going to focus on things a little bit differently than we will in, in Methods 2. In this course, we're going to set up focusing primarily on fixed effects. We're going to deal with most of our treatments uh, and just introduce you to random effects because that's the most clear-cut, simplest way to go about it. And remember, we're going back to um, statistical analyses that we hope you might vaguely remember from when you took these some years ago. In Methods 2, we're going to far more explicitly address mixed effects, which means you have both fixed and random effects, which is much more realistic, actually. It's the way most studies are done in re reality. and probably represent the way we should be doing many more of our analyses in the future. Mixed effects have only really become more possible with the advent of R. Um, fixed effects were far more common with former statistical methods. Okay. Going along with this, we're going to be relying on what are called parametric methods. Parametric statistics are those that assume you have that nice bell curve. You have a mean with a standard deviation and a 95% confidence interval, a very symmetrical box plot, and those kinds of statistics then are far more amenable in fixed effects, whereas with mixed effects models, we can let go of that. You can deal with variation around a mean that is not symmetrical. You can deal with very skewed distributions. They're called non-parametric methods where it essentially doesn't have to have those certain parameters that define that bell curve. You don't need those bell curve parameters in a non-parametric method. Okay? We can deal with homoscedastic. Remember that word? That meant that the size of the bell curve was very much similar between your treatments and normal data in our methods one course. Whereas in methods two, we can deal with bell curves that are very different shapes and that are not necessarily normal. 
okay? Because we're playing with non-parametric methods. And that means that in methods one, we're using simpler methods. In methods two, we move on to advanced methods where we have to remember how it worked in methods one, but we build on that in methods two. Okay. And finally, I think it's fair to say that methods one, the statistics we'll be doing in this course are best for ideal conditions. Um, the simplest settings, lab controlled experiments, um, greenhouses, we can try them in the field, but it gets trickier. This is probably uh, stretching it. If you get to methods two, then y you can um, uh, work better with uh, field data and, and complicated natural set scenarios with um, these other more advanced mixed effects models. Okay, so we've already skimmed through one and two now in these two lectures. What I want to return to just briefly, because you've been very patient, is the design analysis relationship. Just to reiterate that the combination of a priori design, thinking about your study before you do the, and then matching it with the analysis that will come after, is part of how we should be doing science. Ronald Fisher, to return to the old guy from way back in the very beginning of all this, said to call in the statistician after the experiment is done may be no more than asking him to perform a post-mortem examination. He only may be able to say what the experiment died of. Uh, zombie science. We would be doing zombie science if we don't think about how to do the experiment carefully. And unfortunately, that happens far too often. There are a lot of studies far too many master's degrees at lots of universities um, and chapters of, of PhD dissertations that will not get published in part because they were conducted without the analyses being envisioned before the study. So to go back to a study that um, was already conducted and then try to figure out how to analyze it means that you might have this big mismatch in the design and the analysis and you might have a design that does not fit well with any sort of analysis and you're sort of stuck with a salvage job. You might have treatments that are confounded. For example, treatment of increasing fertilizer goes along with um, another treatment, um, let's say, of how much you watered. So when you see more growth in your plants, was it because you watered more or because there was more fertilizer? Those simple things happen sometimes um, with the chance to have avoided them in the front end. And uh, if it's already happened, it's too late to do anything about it when you get back to the analysis later. You might not have uh, sufficient controls, um, positive and negative controls. You might need to think about that very carefully up front. And a big problem would be insufficient replication. Without enough replicates, you tend not to have a fairly weak study where you can't say much. And that's where we're going to try to spend some time on power analyses going forward here. An experiment or a study with more power has greater ability to detect differences between the treatments that you're interested in. A lot of that has to do with having sufficient replication. And the only way to really know about that is to already know something about the system you're going to study. So we'll be getting around to some preliminary experiments and thinking about replication and power coming forward here. All right, so I hope this has convinced you that this is all pretty important for your being able to go on and have a successful career and being able to publish the results of your thesis or dissertation. And I hope this gives you some glimpse into the need for experimental design matching with the analyses that we conduct at the end. All right, that's it for now. That was a long one. Bye.